Good evening and welcome to the Journey Home program. It's a great pleasure to be with you. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this program in which I have the great privilege of introducing to you men and women who because of their great love for Jesus Christ were drawn home to the Catholic Church. Our guest this evening is Father John Bartunek. He is the author of Inside the Passion and what a, an appropriate time to have this interview during Holy Week. And uh, of course it's exciting. I don't know if any of you had a chance to see the kind of new recut version of the Passion. I haven't yet, but I'm looking forward to it. Uh, my nine-year-old didn't see the first version, so I'm going to have a chance to take him to see uh, this newer version of the Passion. And Father John is uh, very intimately connected with that. But before we get to that, Father, welcome to the Journey Home program. Thank you. It's good, good to, to have you here. Uh, before we begin with your journey, and I want to make sure everyone gets a chance to look at this book, because this is a great time during Holy Week to uh, to read this um, before or after seeing the movie or both and, Father? Both and. Both <laughs> and. Because yeah. after you see it, then you can get pick out some things that absolutely, you missed yeah, in the absolutely, process. Absolutely. It's Inside the Passion, published by Ascension Press. And uh, before we get to your, your journey, Father, um, uh, how Inside the Passion? I mean, why did you write this book? It's right inside the middle of the Passion. I was a stroke of providence. I was finishing up my theology studies in Rome. Mel Gibson brought his crew to film The, the Passion. I, I made my way to the set through some friends and friends of friends, and it became an intense two-year behind-the-scenes experience. I was drawn into the project, was involved in the conversations and the decisions, uh, and then in the editing room and the whole post-production. I traveled with Mel during the promotional uh, uh, part of the whole project. I got a chance to ask him questions nobody else asked, and I, the more I found out about the movie, the more I said, Mel, I, I went to Mel, I said, we've got to write a book because it was fascinating to know what went into it. It was unbelievable. You know, changing the screenplay, adding scenes, actors making suggestions, and to know why Mel made all those decisions, you, you understand why it's such a great work of art. And so that's why we wrote Inside the Passion. We didn't want to change the plot too much. Though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Just don't do that cross thing. You know? <laughs> yeah. Peter kind of tried to say that too, yeah, didn't he, in reality. That's right. yeah, we don't want to get there. Well, Father, in this program, uh, I always begin by taking a step back and, uh, and ask you to give us a summary of your pre-Catholic journey, if you would. Pre-Catholic journey. Well, I, I come from a family. I was born in Ohio, grew up in Ohio. Uh, my mother passed away when I was just a boy. I have two sisters, and my dad brought us up uh, to be responsible, hardworking, a lot of sports, you know, kind of normal, healthy American uh, kids. But we didn't go to church. We didn't, um, we didn't have a faith formation. Uh, of any kind, and it was only when I was a teenager uh, that I started to to kind of, you know, get into that. My older sister had been training for the Olympics, and she had a, a horrible accident where she blew out her knee, and her whole, you know, all her dreams wow. were uh, were over. And her coach helped her kind of recover from that and get through that very difficult period. Turns out that her coach was a believing Christian, you know, an evangelical Christian, you know, strong faith in Christ and the Bible. And he shared her, his faith with her, and, and she became a Christian. And that's how we called it, you know, you become a yeah, Christian. Yeah, yeah. And, and then she invited me to go to the church with them. Uh, and I am, she, actually, she really bugged me about it. You know, she really <laughs> made me feel bad that I wasn't going to church. And so she invited me, and I went, and I started. It was, a, it was a Bible church outside of Cleveland called The Chapel. Great preaching. And I was in eighth grade, and I would go on Sunday. And the first time I went, I loved the sermon. So they were just great preachers. You know, they would talk for 45 minutes, and I couldn't get enough of it. So I came back, and then they invited me to join the youth choir. Uh, and so I joined the youth choir uh, and made some friends. And, you know, the people were just so good. They were good people. They were normal. They knew how to have a good time, but they, they were striving to, to follow Christ. Mm -hmm. And I remember during those choir practices, and we would pray before and after, right? And the choir director, everyone would bow their heads. And, of course, at that point, I didn't believe in God. I didn't believe in mm -hmm. Jesus. I didn't believe anything. I liked hanging out with these people, but I didn't believe. So I wouldn't bow my head. I wouldn't pray. And they would all be bowing, and I would just kind of, you know, not enter into that. Uh, but after about seven, eight months, um, I had my own born-again experience. We were on tour. The choir was on tour. And we were singing. So you were traveling with the choir. I was traveling with the choir, be, and I wasn't a believer. A believer. Uh, I wasn't a believer. Did they know that? They knew that, because oh. they knew I didn't pray. Yeah. You know, I didn't yeah. pray when they all prayed. You know? but, but that's kind of how God works. You yeah. know, he, he associates us with, with his friends, and through them we become his friend. Yeah. So, but I remember we were singing the finale, uh, a song called Let There Be Light. Mm -hmm. 
it was in a, a I don't know, was, I think it was a Presbyterian church somewhere in Pennsylvania. And there was a stained glass window in the back of the church and we were singing, Let There Be Light. And from one moment to the next, literally, <laughs> I became a believer. It was a moment of grace. Yeah. And let there be light. This is true. Jesus is real. He cares about me. This is great. I want to learn more. <laughs> and, that, and it was literally just a, a moment of grace. And I, I started studying the Bible. Uh, and then I get, started getting into it a lot and spending a lot of time at the church. And, and my father, who, who has never been involved in organized religion, uh, started getting a little worried. You know, as I'm getting into high school, I'm spending more and more time with these Bible people. And so he, uh, he, he told me at one point, he says, I don't trust those people. I'd prefer you not to go to that church anymore. Uh, and it was kind of my first crisis. Mm -hmm. But I had been reading the Proverbs, uh, a chapter a day, because there's 31. So one for each day of the month. You always know which chapter you're on. You don't lose your place. And over and over again in the book of Proverbs, it says that a wise son heeds his father, obeys his father. So I decided to obey my father, and I stopped going to the church. I kept studying the Bible on my own and reading and praying. Uh, and so for the last few years of high school, it was just sports and academics and try to get into a good college. And, and my faith kind of went into the back burner. Um, and then I went to college. And you know, when you go to college, you can do whatever you want, right? <laughs> it's rebellion time. So I was free to do whatever I want. So every Sunday I went to church, started going to well, that's church. That's an interesting, interesting form of rebellion. You, you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, it was, but it was, uh, that's what I did. You know, I just kind of church hopped. I went to yeah. different church every Sunday, looking for a good one that was one like the one back in Cleveland. I eventually found a really good college group and started building some friendships there and a good Christian atmosphere with people who really wanted to make Christ their priority on campus. Mm -hmm. I went to Stanford University, mm -hmm. which is fairly liberal in a lot of ways, yeah. and it's not easy to you know, follow your Christian faith in that mm -hmm. environment, as any college campus right. really, but it, was, uh, but it worked out pretty well. And that's kind of, uh, it was at college then when I started to, uh, okay. when I had my first link with the Catholic Church. All right, well let's back up a bit. Interesting, a couple things. Um, in your non-religious upbringing, mm -hmm. Uh, was it just never a discussion of your family, never an issue, or was there any anti-religion or anti-Catholic aspect of that? Yeah, it just never came up. Ah, okay. It wasn't even on the radar screen. Uh, had your father had any experience himself, and no, he moved away from it, or just? I found out later that he had. It's very interesting. Uh. After I was confirmed, years later, he came to my confirmation. And then he took us all out for pizza afterwards. Yeah, you know? it's like, <laughs> even though he wasn't, you know, he yeah. wasn't a believer, and at one point he even told me he's an atheist. But then afterwards, the day after, we were having a beer together, you know, cooking hamburgers. And I said, "So, Dad, what do you think about all this stuff?" And he goes, "Well, it's kind of above my head, you know. But if that's where you need to go, that's okay." And then he paused, and then he started remembering. Mm -hmm. You know, my dad used to have a crucifix over his bed. I said, "Crucifix? He must have been Catholic." I didn't know anything of his own, you know, his family background. He said, what else? Turns out that my, my grandfather, who had owned a clothing factory in Cleveland, Ohio, had been a very devout, practicing Catholic, actually made all the cassocks for the priests and the Jesuits in Cleveland and all that. He was really involved in the Catholic community. Uh, and my dad, so my dad had started out in Catholic schools. I think, I haven't gotten all the details, I think that my grandmother was from a Protestant background. Mm -hmm. And so maybe, maybe that was why eventually he stopped, you know, kind of going. going. We haven't really gone into the details. But there was that going for me. There was this kind of Catholic remote yeah. preparation for the priesthood, yeah. I guess, or for my own Catholic faith. Uh, but we, when, when I was growing up, it just never came up. We just never talked about it. We were occupied with other stuff. But you know, you also touched on something which is significant, and that is um, the struggle between when our parents hold a real strong position and we have certain loyalty mm -hmm. to their position, and th the issue of conversion involves a challenge to that yeah. itself. I mean, so you went through a bit of that. I mean, my guess is there are people watching that find themselves in that position. What do I do? Yeah. My father holds a position that's so different than where I am. I feel like when I go on this spiritual journey that I'm spitting in his face. Mm -hmm. I mean, was there a little bit of that struggle even yourself when you were going through that? Mm -hmm. You said in high school you kind of backed away, but when you right. went away to college? Right. Well, there was a little bit of that in this period. Okay. Um, but, you know, and I always, and I don't, I don't think there's an easy answer. I don't think there's a formula. You have to, we have to love our parents. Mm -hmm. We have to respect them. We have to love them. Uh, but our love for God is first. So if, in, you know, God forbid, there's a moment when we have to decide. You know, our Lord says, he who, uh, you know, loves father and mother and brother more than me, 
you know, is not worthy of me. So in the end, if there is a conflict, we have to be with God. But where that, this conflict for me became a little more intense when I told my dad I was going to join the seminary. Okay, well, let's, <laughs> <laughs> let's back a bit from there okay. then. So here you are, you're in college, um, involved with, re involved with like university or something really It was active. a Presbyterian church that had a college ministry okay. nearby. Very so active that with that. Yeah, very active. Um, and I, it really is yeah. unique when I think about, you know, you're rebelling from your parents by going to church, <laughs> <or> from your dad <laughs> by going to church. I mean, that was the opposite yeah. for me. But it, um, were you encouraged with that with your particular group of Christians? Uh, it was a great group. Okay. It was a great group. You know, they were all very talented people, and we all we met once a week during the week for a worship service on campus, and then on Sunday at the church, and then we had retreats a couple times a year. And our friendships were really built around trying to to follow Christ, to be His true disciples on campus in that life. In fact, it makes me ask you this question before we move on. It says in Vatican II in the ecumenical document that we must not forget that whatever the Holy Spirit has engraced in the hearts of our separated brethren is for our spiritual renewal. We can mm -hmm. learn some things. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look back on those days when you Absolutely. were in college, what are some things you remember that are a real challenge to us? I mean, should we be doing that same stuff on college campuses? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, there was no, it was always, what can we do to, to bring the message to, to our friends? That, that was like our highest priority. We were thinking about how can we live you know, more like Christ, but how can we spread? How can we grow? Uh, you know, where, where are the needs of our peers, and, and how can we communicate Christ to them? That was our passion. And, and the other thing was the love for Scripture. Hmm. You know, I mean, every, we all spent time every day on our knees reading the Bible and looking for God's will there. That's something that you know, a lot of Catholics who I've met since, you know, we, we ha don't have that love for Scripture. And there's a great treasure there. God works through His Scriptures. Yeah. He really does. Uh, of course, within the, 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 the guidance of the church and, and the authority established by him, but the love for scriptures, but that idea that, you know, I don't have to be a priest or a nun or a monk in order to dedicate myself to spreading God's kingdom, to inviting people uh, to come, to come to church. And we were always inviting people to come to our worship service. Mm -hmm. come to, we were kind of concocting events where we could invite other people to get them in, to convert them, to bring them into Christ, to make them into Christians. And that zeal uh, is something I still have, but I learned it there. And I think, you know, we can all learn from that. Yeah, I and mean, that's one of the reasons I believe that when I look at all the converts that we do within the Journey Home mm -hmm. program that I work with in the Coming Home Network, and sometimes, especially the clergy converts, after they convert to the church, they wonder, well, what about, what, what was God doing with me way back then? You know, I felt that he called me to seminary, or, mm -hmm. but now I'm a Catholic. Well, mm -hmm. what did that mean back then? And I really believe that that the callings that we see way back then were in preparation for what we can do now as Catholics. Absolutely. So all the training we got, the experience and scripture study and evangelization yeah, is for yeah. what we can do now that we're in the church right. and inspired you as a priest Absolutely. for that enthusiasm you know, for scripture and evangelization. Yeah, yeah. You got back then. Yeah, it all started then. God doesn't yeah. waste anything, yeah. you know? You know from your own life and he doesn't waste anything. Yeah. He's always thinking ahead. <laughs> so. All right, so you're in college. I'm in college. Of all places, what started to open your heart to? Not at a Catholic college. It wasn't Stanford, a Catholic college so at all. No. Why there did you actually have your heart open to the Catholic well, church? Well, there, there's where God's sense of humor comes in. <laughs> I chose my major for history, because when you study history, you can study everything. It includes math and science <laughs> and you know, art, whatever you want. And I chose as my advisor this great professor uh, who happened to be a post-atheist, uh, Jewish, and... Um, well, post-atheist. Maybe I should explain that. <laughs> he considered that even the question of whether or not God existed was irrelevant. Well, so he wasn't post-atheist in the positive direction. He was post-atheist no. in the negative direction. Yeah, post-atheist in the sense that, you know, any, even the question of religion is, like, not even relevant, uh, not even worth talking about. Okay, so this was his, uh, and Jewish himself by culture, and, you know, proud of that. And he taught Jewish history. He was a great professor. Mm -hmm. And we hit it off really well in one class, and I asked him to be my advisor. So we started doing this independent study. Because uh, I couldn't fit another course into my semester, but I wanted to study about Buddhism. And he was an expert in all world religions and spoke 12 languages and great, great man, great professor. So we would meet once a week. Uh, he would give me a book to read on Buddhism. I would read it and we would meet and he would ask me questions and, and so I was learning about Buddhism. And at one point, and, and these conversations about Buddhism always transformed into conversations about Christianity. 
because I was involved in this Protestant, <laughs> you know, this, this Protestant church, right? And, and he was post-atheist. So he was always trying to deconvert me. And I was always trying to convert him. <laughs> so we always started talking about you know, Buddha, and we ended up talking about, why aren't you Christian? Why am I Christian? And at one point, he became exasperated in one of these discussions, and he, told me, he said something that I, I, I've never forgotten, and it was the beginning of my conversion. Mm -hmm. He said, look, if you have to be religious, which you shouldn't, <laughs> but if you have to be, there's only two real religions in the world. That's coming from you know, a man with I don't know how many PhDs and languages, really brilliant guy. There's only two real religions in the world. There's Judaism and there's Roman Catholicism. And you're not Jewish, he told me. <laughs> it, it blew me away. Because up to that point, the only exposure I'd had to Roman Catholicism was through the little pamphlets, the Jack Chick pamphlets oh, in the back of yeah. our churches. Uh, you know? Anti-Catholics you can get. Anti-Catholic, yeah. which misrepresent what Catholicism yeah. is about. So that was my idea. So here's this incredibly intelligent, well-informed, educated man telling me that Catholicism is you know, a better religion than the one I'm doing. And it, it completely threw me for a loop. The next year, uh, I went to Italy from, for a semester overseas. And while I was in the plane, I remember thinking to myself, hey, you know, I think Italy's pretty Catholic. I think the Pope lives there. <laughs> so maybe this would be a good chance for me to figure out what my professor meant about what was, to get the good stuff from the Catholic religion yeah. and, you know, leave the bad stuff behind. Because I was convinced that Catholics weren't even Christians, you know, because they have mm. statues and all that kind of stuff. Is that from the influence of the, your, your, the evangelicals? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Because we were taught, you know, that Catholics yeah. were, it was an instrument of the devil, the Catholic Church, in order to distract Christians from the true mm. faith. That's what I had been taught. So I know this is kind of a long version, no, but, no, but it's no, interesting that, so I got to Italy uh, and I spent, I ended up spending two trimesters in Florence, Italy, and then one trimester in Krakow, Poland. So my whole year was in Europe. <sighs> wow. Poland was still communist at the time. Mm -hmm. Actually, it was the year of the elections when Solidarity, the mm -hmm. first free elections, and that was the beginning of the end, 1989. Mm -hmm. So 88, 89, I spent in Europe. I get to Florence and we get off the bus and Piazzale Michelangelo, looking over the valley, the Arno Valley, where the city, you know, the city of Michelangelo and the Renaissance started there. And it still looks like that. So I get off the bus, I look down at the city, and it was like love at first sight. It was so beautiful. I felt like I was stepping into a fairy tale. You know, Cleveland just doesn't look like this. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and from that moment on, I just couldn't get enough. I spent all my free time kind of visiting sites, the chapels, the churches, the museums, drinking in the beauty of the art. Mm. And of course, you know that all that art is yeah. Catholic. Yeah. So the more I wanted to learn more and more about the art so I could get more and more into it. And as I did, I was getting more and more of the Catholic faith. My art history professor saw what was going on, started kind of directing me. Turns out she's a very faithful Catholic woman. She recognized what was going on, and she started giving me indirect catechesis. Oh, you need to go up to this church and see this painting, and while you're there, talk to Father Tom, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so she would introduce me to people, and so I spent a year really just falling in love with the church mm -hmm. through the cultural heritage, through the beauty of the art. Mm -hmm. And that opened my heart. By the time I, and, and a similar thing happened in Poland, seeing the testimony especially of the mm -hmm. faith there of the people, mm -hmm. which was really giving them hope against the communists. By the time I got back from my senior year in college, in my heart I was already Catholic. I was defending the Pope and the Virgin Mary, <laughs> but I didn't know the doctrine, but my heart was open. And so I started meeting with the chaplain every couple weeks and just going through kind of a personalized instruction. And he answered all my questions. And uh, about a year and a half after I graduated, I was confirmed. Did, how were your uh, evangelical friends taking this? They furled their brows. They couldn't figure it out. Yeah. They couldn't figure it out. And I couldn't figure out why they couldn't figure it out. Yeah. It was funny, our conversations, I was like, oh, look, look at all this. Look, there's so much more. There's all the history. There's the saints. There's the pope. There's, there's the art. Isn't this great? Don't you want this too? And, you know, they didn't. And that's when I began to realize that it was God who was, you know, pulling me along. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a purely, you know, there's a grace involved in there because, mm -hmm. you know, to, to overcome their biases. And, uh, and most of my friends still haven't converted. There's that dichotomy, interesting thing about... Uh, in here a little bit. When, you're, when you've spent all your life in America, in any place in America, the Catholic Church is no older than the Protestant churches. That's There's true. no That's sense true. of history. Yeah. Uh, the art is a, is a cacophony of voices, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. in any place in America, unless you're maybe in Quebec, where the Catholic <laughs> right, Church right. goes way back, or maybe, uh, you know, uh, St. Augustine down in Florida, or some of the missions. But mm -hmm. other than that, it's almost all the same. And so when you go to Europe, you see this right. great division. 
Um, mm -hmm. So the beauty of going there and seeing the art, the cathedrals, the places, I mean, right. it's wonderful. It just opens you up. You go to, you go to England and you see a, you see a cathedral that you know was Catholic and has stolen property because you can tell <laughs> that there were places where statues used to be and they're not there. I mean, so you see that. But the dichotomy of that is yet the Europeans seem to have lost their faith so, so much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so in a sense, they, they, they become so used to that division yeah. that they take it for granted. You know, so there's in, in the same case, we become blind to the, it over here in the States, but over there they take it for granted. I'm sure you go to Florence and there's, yeah, you know, yeah, people have true. seen it all their life and it's no big deal, you know. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. So the freshness of what you discover then open. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I'll make a comment here, we're going to take a break in a moment, but you mentioned twice, and I want you to talk more about this now looking back, um, the importance of grace in conversion. Often in this program, people will give the intellectual side, the right, apologetics right. argument, but you recognize it really it was just a touch of grace, it, wasn't it? It really was. You know, the, in order to get to the mind, uh, to the ideas, for me, and, I, and I've, you've talked to so mm. many conferences, it's similar, the heart has to be open. Mm. I have to be willing to hear what the church says about itself. I wasn't listening. I thought, you know, Catholics were like some very strange cult. I didn't care what they had mm. to say. I just wanted them, you know, to save them from the Catholic Church. But once I saw, once I had that experience in Europe where God really touched my heart, in this case through beauty, through beauty informed and, and inspired by faith, by the Catholic faith, uh, then I was open mm. to listen. But that was a special grace. You know, it yeah. didn't happen to the, uh, yeah. there were a couple other Christians in the group. And I was there's that mystery of grace. Yeah, the same a, people can look mystery. at the same thing. Yeah, exactly. And not all come right. away with the, the effect of efficacious grace. Yeah, that's why these heart. journeys are so personal. Every journey is personal. Yeah. And every listener, you know, who watches you, wherever they are, they're in a, they're in a place that God knows where they are, and, and you know, He's leading them as a father, personally, knowing what each needs. And for me, it was the beauty of art that opened my heart. Mm -hmm. you know, but that was a grace from God. Which is gonna connect with being involved with art, yeah. inside that's the right. passion. That's right. We're gonna take a break. One of the first things, though, I want to find out when we get back from the break is whatever got into your mind to put this collar around your neck. <laughs> so we'll talk about that in a bit. Okay. And those of you who are watching, I want to remind you that the book uh, by Father uh, Bartunek is available on EWTN's Religious Catalog. Uh, that phone number, in case you're anxious for a book you want to read during the Holy Week, is 1-800-854-6316. That's Inside the Passion by Father John Bartunek. We'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back. Our guest this evening is Father John Bartunek. He is the author of Inside the Passion, which has a forward by Mel Gibson. All right. So maybe we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the whole experience, though. Though you've been on Bookmark, right? I have. Okay. Right. So you've also, at other times, have been able to talk about the book on the uh, EWTN. We've got a couple emails and a phone call waiting, but before we get there, the collar. <laughs> I mean, the, the, to me, the interesting thing is that you had no influence of that in your family and no, all no, that. At what no. point did you discern this call to the priesthood? I, it's, uh, I still laugh at that myself <laughs> because it happened, it, w it was simultaneous. It wasn't, I became Catholic and then after a little while as a Catholic, I said, hey, why not be a priest? It wasn't that way at all. Before I was Catholic, while I was still on that year overseas, yeah. I remember vividly the moment when the idea first came to my head, and then it never left. A friend of mine and I, we were in Krakow, Poland, right, which is where yeah. the current pope used to be, yeah. the archbishop and the cardinal, and, yeah. and we, we heard about this famous church, the Church of the Ark, which Karol Wojtyla had fought to have built under the communist era in the fi uh, when he was uh, archbishop there, because th it was built in this new city called Nova Huta, which means new city, which was supposed to be the ideal communist city. Now, in an ideal communist city, there's no place for a church, yeah. okay? But the pastor of the city said, no, we need a church. And he fought against it, and he went back and forth, diplomacy and politics, and he got a church built. And it was a symbol of hope for the people, the Catholics there, because the Pope, uh, mm -hmm. Pope Paul VI contributed to it, church communities from around the world contributed money to it or raw materials, so it became the symbol of hope and resistance against communism. So we heard about this church, a friend of mine and I, and we said, well, let's go there for Mass. 
Yeah, it's like a cultural experience, right? <laughs> and at this point, I was already falling in love with the church because of my experience in Italy and the beauty of the arts. And so we went there for Mass. We got there early, climbed up to the balcony where no one would see us. And it was strange because there were no pews in this church. And so it's a strange church with no pews. We found out why as soon as the people started coming in, because they kept coming in. It was packed to the gills. There was no room for pews in this church. Mm -hmm. And the mere you know, amount of people who were in this church for, for Mass shocked us. And then when they, as soon as they got in the church, everyone was silent. So as they gathered, it was pure silence preparing for this service, for this Mass. That shocked us. Mm -hmm. Then the Mass started, and we were agog. We couldn't, mm -hmm. that you could feel the devotion. You could feel mm -hmm. the faith of these people. You could touch it. And at the consecration, everyone hit their knees, mm -hmm. moment of silence, utter reverence, a whole different scope of, of mm -hmm. religiosity that we had, neither of us had seen before. Me as a believing Christian, and the whole experience really kind of threw us for a loop. And on the way home from that Mass, I was in the tram uh, you know, around noon thinking to myself, wow, that was amazing. And I was just standing there, sunlight coming through the window of the tram, and this idea pops into my head. John, maybe you should be a priest. <laughs> it, was, it was that clear. I looked around, I laughed out loud, and you know, I was thinking to myself, oh yeah, my girlfriend's going to get a kick out of that, you know? <laughs> so, but from that moment, the idea never left my head. It was like a, a sunrise. It starts off, you know, you can barely tell when it begins, but it never stops. It just keeps going and going mm -hmm. and going. And two, two and a half years later, I entered the seminary. So the, the point is, that was before I was Catholic. Yeah. The whole process of becoming Catholic for me was like falling in love with the church. Mm -hmm. It was just so beautiful and it was so wonderful and the history and it had done so much and all the saints and I wanted to get in there. I wanted to be on that team. And, and the more I learned, the more I fell in love, the more I wanted to give everything for the church. And so when I was confirmed, I after con confirmation, I went up to the priest who had been my spiritual director during my conversion and I said, hey, can I join the seminary now? I want to go now. <laughs> and he said, no, wait, just to not confuse. And so I moved to Chicago where I, I left my teaching career, which I had started after, after college, and then I moved to Chicago and began pursuing my original career idea, which was to write and produce movies about historical subjects. Right? And they said, well, maybe God doesn't want me to be a priest, so I'll just do it. But it just kept burning and burning and getting the idea of being a priest. I wanted to give everything. I wanted to give everything. That's the only explanation, and that's what God put on my heart. And when I met the Legionaries of Christ, which is the order that I'm a member of now, mm. uh, I visited, and all those other guys who were there, they wanted the same thing. <laughs> just, we had give it all. We want to give it all. You know, wear ourselves out for Christ uh, as fast as possible. Uh, and so that's kind of how it happened. Oh, uh, it was a simultaneous hard. thing. We're going to, we've got a phone call and email. Before I go to them, on one last question, uh, although this might be a long question, but um, you were involved in this great, great work of grace that God gave you to be involved with the passion, mm -hmm. the movie. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. like your conversion, which is a touch of grace <laughs> and all that. This was an, a graced moment. True. You happened to be there and all of that. But talk a bit about the connection between your conversion, your call to ministry, priesthood, mm -hmm. and the writing of this book and this movie. Is, is there real connections there? You can see that this was all a part of a God's uh, plan for you. Absolutely. Abs you know, it's it's uh, it's uncanny, you know how yeah. how creative God's providence is. Uh, I I met when they were filming in Rome. I was finishing up my theology studies in the last year and a half, more or less, before ordination, and I got involved with the film. And of course, my own background in because I mentioned my original career idea of mm -hmm. writing and producing films. I had always been involved in theater. I was even a professional actor for a brief huh. period, uh, and then here I was preparing for my priesthood. And, you know, the priesthood is uh, it's becoming another Christ yeah. and especially identifying with him in his sacrifice, the Mass, mm. the self-offering, and extending that sacrifice through our own ministry, through the sacrament, and through our preaching, and through... Uh, and so I was meditating on the Passion, and I we were pre as preparing for my own ordination. I get involved in the film and spend the time on the set and spend the time and be involved with that. But then what happened, Soon, the more I got involved, it, the more I realized that, you know, wait a minute, people are going to see this movie, they're going to love it. But it's like going to uh, uh, one of those beautiful cathedrals. You go and you're inspired and you love it. But if you have someone by your side who knows what the artist yeah. was thinking, what the symbolism really is, the different levels of meaning, you get so much more out mm. of it. Yeah. Oh, yes. And I really felt, it, the idea came, I said, that's perfect, you know, that's exactly what got me into the church, you know, 
the understanding the, the, the meaning behind the beauty of the art. And here is a great, you know, one of the first great works of, of Christian art, of Catholic art, at the beginning of a new millennium. I'm involved. I have a chance. To, I'm, I'm right beside Mel. He's making all the decisions. <laughs> so I've got to write this book. And so I talked to Mel, and that's kind of how it happened. What a blessing. Yeah, so wow. it's all connected. What a blessing. <laughs> so I was thinking if you, if you described the need of this. You can sit down and read Dante's Inferno. Mm -hmm. It's difficult. <laughs> it's tough to Unless read. you have, for example, Dorothy Sayers' version, which has the wonderful notes that help you understand yes. every person in it, exactly. how it rhymes, the meaning of these words that we don't even use anymore. Uh -huh. Then it comes alive. Yeah, and levels. that's kind of what you want to do in this, yeah. to bring yeah. alive some of the things that maybe your average person won't appreciate in the movie. Right, right. Help see some of the background. Of that. Okay, let's go to our first caller, Spencer from New York. Hello, Spencer. What's your question? Well, um, thank you for taking my call. My question is, how is it possible for a movie to be a great work of visual art like the Sistine Chapel or the Last Supper? Is it really possible? Great question. Well, I think the proof is in the pudding. <laughs> no, I mean, this this is when you see this movie. Uh, movie, is, the film is, is an art form. It's a form because what is art, or it can be an art form. You know, what is art? Art is always an act of communication. You have a vision, you have an idea, uh, and religious art is a spiritual idea. It's connected with the truths of our faith, and the artist is given this gift to be able to represent his special vision, which is which is linked to his artistic sensibility, which is a gift from God to communicate that vision, to put it in some kind of form, whether it's a song or a painting or a poem, put it in some, so that someone else can see that and then share in that vision and be enriched by that vision. Mm -hmm. And film is one of the most powerful art forms out there. Yeah. I'm convinced that if Michelangelo were alive today, yeah. you know, one of two things. He'd either be a head of an ad agency and making commercials, because a lot of creativity goes into you know, TV commercials and that kind yeah. of thing, or he'd be making movies because it involves everything. It involves music, it involves movement, and, uh, and imaging, and lighting. Every detail of this film, mm -hmm. and all the great films, are consciously chosen. Just like every detail of a painting is consciously chosen in order to communicate a message. It, it is a, an art form, and when you find out what went into this film, uh. you really discover the many levels on which this particular film is a, is a master work of art. You know, and right uh, behind this question, and I'm not implying that Spencer's saying this, but there are people out there who their ideologies immediately um, um, consider movies as evil, mm, right. that whole genre. Right. But when you look at the history of art, I mean, it, it, at any stage in, in art history, there were those that thought paintings, or statues, or the mm -hmm. theater, mm -hmm. or books, mm -hmm. the printing press, right. that during different times they they would have the view that the, the medium itself was evil, right. rather than recognizing that the medium is a gift. It's how our consciences, the form consciences, use the mediums. Yeah, I mean, there's lousy books <laughs> right. that should never be read. There are lousy plays that should never be seen. There are lousy mm -hmm. pieces of art yeah. that should never be seen. That doesn't mean throw the whole thing out. No. There's an old phrase, you know, the, the, the classic phrase that says, the abuse does not take away the use. And that's exactly it. Exactly you know? right. Yeah. Christ, you know, Christi Christians have been doing art for a long time. That's why I became a Catholic because yeah. I got exposed to this art, and and film is a great art form. We have to reclaim that. For exactly. The we have In to fact, reclaim John, it. John Paul just about three or four weeks ago received, uh, you know, released an apostolic letter on the 40th anniversary of the uh, the Vatican II document on the media. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And he, in there, he confirms the use of this technology Absolutely. for the spread of the gospel yeah. for what it was intended. Uh, why God gave us uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. television. You know, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> right. This is what we're supposed to be doing. And you know, Lord Jesus, I pray that we're doing what is honorable yeah. to Him uh, in this work. Let's take this email. Uh, dear, this comes from Steve in Idaho. He, he writes, Dear Father Bertunic, have you heard of any atheists being moved to faith in Christ after viewing the Passion of the Christ? Thank you, Steve. Well, not just with the viewing. There was a lot of viewing, but there are actually atheists who were moved to faith in the making of the film. It was amazing to see, you know, if you talk to Mel, everyone who worked on this film was changed hmm. for the better. Everyone. Yeah, I'll just give one example. <laughs> you know, that's why it's so interesting to get, become an expert in this film, to know what went into it. Uh, the actor who played Judas, an Italian guy, hmm. who as a child had, you know, was born into a Catholic family, but very early on left the faith, wasn't practicing the faith. At the beginning of the film, he was a vocal atheist. And he made sure that everyone knew that he, wanted, he was doing this as an actor, but he didn't believe in any of this stuff. 
you know, vocally, and you know, with a kind of a chip on his shoulder in a sense. By the end of the filming, after he saw the first cut version, uh, he asked one of the priests on the set for confession. Huh. Came back to the faith. He baptized his children. He sanctified his marriage. Praise God. Uh -huh. And that's one case of many. Hmm. It was unbelievable to see God working through this film. You made a good point there, an aside, that audience may not realize that to a certain extent when you're in, you're doing a movie, s different scenes are recorded at different sequences, yes. right? So the whole thing doesn't necessarily come together mm -hmm. until that first viewing, right? Absolutely, absolutely. It's the, it's the director who is the mastermind behind the film. He's the one who can see all the pieces. It's like doing a mosaic. Yeah. You do each piece individually, and then the one who, the master designer, brings them all together, and you only see it all together at the end. It's, it, it's why being on the set sometimes is kind of boring, you know, <laughs> little pieces here and there. You wonder how it fits. Yeah, you, know, yeah, you yeah, don't know yeah. how it goes. And okay. Uh, let's go with Carrie from Georgia. Hello, Carrie. What's your question? Thank you, Marcus, for taking my question. Yeah. Father, what do you think people will learn in your book that will help them to better connect with the passion as they pray and meditate on that part of Christ's life? Thank you, Carrie. It's a good question. I think one of the ideas of the book uh, is to give, first of all, uh, what was in the mind of the director. So, because when you, when you know why the artist made his choices, it helps you kind of uh, uncover more levels of meaning in the different scenes. You know, every scene, everything is thought of. That's one level. In the book as well, however, I try to give a little more historical, theological, and spiritual context uh, behind those decisions. You know, mm -hmm. How do they fit in? What's the significance? You know, questions, for instance, the difference between violence and suffering. Mm -hmm. It's important to know what that difference is. And why did our Lord choose to suffer to save us? Mm -hmm. I, I, I include reflections on those issues and tie them into the film. Uh, it's because the film really is a meditation, and it's kind of it's inexhaustible in a sense, uh, as every great work of religious art is. You can constantly go back to it. Or the different types of guilt. For instance, why Judas didn't repent, uh, did, you know, why he, he, get, he fell into despair, but Peter didn't. Mm -hmm. It comes across in the film, but it's very subtle. Mm -hmm. And the book gives you a chance to reflect, to go a little deeper. Uh, and it really, the people who've read it, I've been very encouraged by the reactions. They've, they, they've really been enhanced in their own reflection on the passion and on the film itself. So I think that's the kind of thing you can get if, you, if you're able to, to read the book. One of my favorite scenes in the movie, and I know this is for many people, is that the scene where you see uh, Mary, you know, weeping, and then a little flashback to the, the, little, uh, the, right, to right, the right, childhood. Right. I mean, that was, yeah. uh, I was wondering when they were making that, was it as powerful in the process or was it, is it just r after later when you see it in the movie? I mean, it, I, I, it's interesting. It was kind of the, I asked Mel about every scene yeah. and every detail, even the scenes that didn't make it into yeah. the final version. <laughs> <laughs> I talk about those in the book, but that scene, uh, you know, I asked Mel and he says, oh, he said that he knew it was going to tear your heart out. <laughs> he knew. No one else did. No one else really did, but he knew it was going to tear your heart out. Uh, and it's interesting, that scene was, the scene that, that got them over the hump for the musical score. Doing the music for this movie was extremely mm. difficult. He had a number of composers working on it. No one was getting it quite right. They finally found John Debney to do some things, and he was on the right track, but it still wasn't where mm. Mel wanted it to be. Uh, John Debney, faithful Catholic, he started praying the rosary, asking the Blessed Mother to help him. He was working on this scene. It wasn't working out. Mel was considering going to another composer. And he, so he pr three days prayed the rosary. The next morning he woke up before his alarm clock and a melody was in his head with the words. He started working on it. Turns out it was musical form of a lullaby. And that is the melody that was used in that scene you know, with his flashback. Yeah. And if you wa when you watch it again, you notice that the music is what really puts you over the edge. Mm -hmm. It goes perfectly with the, with the statement of Christ, I, I make all things new, with the flashback, it just adds. And from that, that was over the hump. After that, the rest of the music just kind of flowed, and they were able to, to get it all done in time. So that is a powerful scene, and there's many different levels. I, I kind of discussed that in, in the Oh, moment. great. Excellent. Yeah. Take this next email. This comes from uh, Ryan in Florida. Dear Father Bartunic, what, why do the apostles call Mary mother in the movie? It wasn't in the Bible. <laughs> uh, well, it's kind of like, why does everyone who... Uh, <laughs> who used to, to work or was in the network of Mother Teresa of Calcutta. You know, everyone who was involved in the network, volunteers, and everybody, they all called her mother. 
here at EWTN. Everyone who works here calls Mother Angelica mother. Mary is the mother of the church. Yep. She's the mother of Christ. The church is the body of Christ. And that's her role in the faithful. And so, you know, for Catholics, it makes perfect sense. You call her mother because, you know, we're, we're, we're part of the family. Yeah. We've become part of the family in Christ. There's a lot of levels theologically that explore that. Uh, you know, mother of the church means also, in a sense, sharing and giving birth to the church, sharing in Christ's own suffering, sharing in the redemption in a special way. All that comes out in the film, and it's worth reflecting on those things and going a little deeper, uh, you know, the kind of thing that we do in the book. I was thinking um, there's another layer of that which I think connects with your background too, and that is, you see, I came from an evangelical Protestant adult experience. Mm -hmm. My upbringing was Lutheran, but later I was more evangelical, very much sola scriptura, almost to the point of worship scripture. Mm -hmm. Literally, in terms of I was very committed to the literal interpretation of that. So, when someone would add a word, it would bug me. Mm. You don't go beyond scripture. Right. All right. right, right. And I, I think that's also what this author's getting at that's this idea point. of, you know, that so you take the Bible, you put it to screen, you end up with those that have done that, and they're so truncated to only what is said there. Right. And I believe that's the beauty of our Catholic understanding of tradition and scripture. It, it frees us up to be able to recognize that there was a whole. Yes. Jesus' life wasn't just one-dimensional, two-dimensional. It was yeah. three-dimensional, as were all of these people. That's why, for example, one of the, uh, the best books that describe the life of Christ in a very readable way is The Greatest Story Ever Told, a mm -hmm. great novel mm -hmm. written by a Catholic. <laughs> You know, they had the freedom to understand uh -huh. the bigger uh -huh. picture. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. you went through that same transition yourself absolutely. from evangelicalism to Catholicism. Oh, yeah, you're absolutely right. And that's why you know, uh, some of the people who've complained about the use of mother in the film, the apostles calling Mary mother, none of them complain about the flashback, the first flashback where we see Jesus building a table <laughs> and Mary goes and they, you know, and they have that little exchange. And that's not in the Bible, yeah, right. but nobody complains about it because it rings true, right? Yeah. So, and it's the same thing with the motherhood of Mary. It's a natural thing. Someone, a woman like that who's fulfilled her vocation, she, she is the mother. She is a mother, and even for those others. And, and in, you know, in, at Pentecost, she was there, and they were gathered with, right. you know, her, with Mary, and she really kind of mothered the early church. So, those are all great points. Thank you, Father. Let's take this next email, or phone call. Maria from Long Island. Hello, Maria, what's your question? Hi there. Um, my question was, how has father's family been affected? Have they been um, mm. converted, or what has mm. been the effects? About from my conversion, I imagine. Right. right. That. Okay. Um, well, uh, you know, I can't read their hearts completely, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, none of them have become Catholic. Uh, my, my, dad, my dad and I have always maintained a really close friendship, something I'm very grateful mm. for. Uh, you know, we've had our differences on things, but he's always been there, he's been faithful, and I see him frequently. You know, I get to visit home, uh, and I see him, and, and he started to pray. He started to read some things mm -hmm. that I've given him, and uh, so he, he's, he's looking in. He's retired now, and he's, he's reflecting on those issues. He's, he's told me a few times, you know, that at first he, he, he resisted my entrance into the seminary strongly <laughs> as a non-believer and a non catholic what a waste he said what a waste you know all your education and all the things you could do and you're going to become a priest but now he he sees that i'm happy he sees that i you know I, i've got a lot to do <laughs> mm -hmm, yeah. i'm not sitting around twiddling my thumbs and he respects that and he's been encouraged by that my two sisters are both very strong very faithful evangelical christians mm -hmm. Uh, and they're, you know, they're very open as well. They're, they're very happy with the fact that I'm happy, that I, I, they really believe I am where God has called me to be, but neither one has, yeah. uh, has taken a step to, to become a Catholic. Yeah. Pray for them, please. Yeah, and, and that's very common. I mean, mm -hmm. again, we're talking about grace. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, we're time. talking about grace. Take our another phone call. Amy from Georgia, what's your question, please? Marcus, Father, how has writing a book about the past <coughs> impacted me. your faith journey? Like, has it drawn you closer to Christ? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> you know, it was another stroke of God's providence that I was ordained to the priesthood a few months before the Passion came out, hmm. when I was full time with Mel in post production. You know, I took a break to go back to Rome to get ordained, and then I came back to Los Angeles. So the whole time that I was working on the film, that I was gathering information for the book, that I was contemplating uh, you know, with Mel, contemplating this work of art, being drawn into it. It, it, it complete, 
th that Lent, my first Lent and Easter as a priest, <laughs> was Whoa. you know a whole another level, and and a lot of it was because of this experience that I had had. Uh, you know, this is how God has spoken to me in so many ways through art, and being involved in this work of art made a huge difference. I went to the missions for Holy Week at my first year as a priest, and so I had a chance to celebrate all the liturgies. I was the only priest in the town, you know, this was down in Mexico, mm -hmm. and I was the only priest there hearing confessions all day, uh, celebrating all the liturgies of Holy Week, preaching, and, and the experience of having worked on the film and spent all that time thinking about the passion, writing about it, contemplating it, informed everything I did, and I was so grateful for that. All right, thank you, Father. Let's take a final break. We'll come back in a moment with some more words for the journey home. Welcome back. Our guest is Father John Bartunik, and uh, it's great to have you with us, Father, and, and uh, what a great privilege you had to be involved with that movie. I was just thinking that there certainly are some movies where when you see the inside out, maybe even some old religious movies that it might not have led people to faith. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I mm -hmm. don't want to nail any particular movie, but I think about the ending of the Jesus Christ Superstar, where they're all just kind of <laughs> going back to the bus, you know, and they're looking back like, what was this all about? <laughs> you know, and I wonder, we're here, this is a movie where being involved with the inside was a strength to faith. Yeah, not in the yeah, opposite direction. Right, I mean, right. that's the blessing of that. I hope it's kind of the beginning of a trend, you know? So oh. other films and people will take courage and, and do the same kind of thing. Yeah, well, so. praise God. Let's take one last email. Um, this comes from D, no, excuse me, from Chris in, uh, from Delaware. Father, what was, uh, I was just wondering, what was the animal that was in the scene with Judas at the end of his life. What was the reason for, it, for having it there? It was a very pleasant scene there, if I remember correctly. <laughs> <laughs> for so th those that may not have seen the movie, what is right. she referring to? That, mu that must be the rotting donkey carcass <laughs> that's right next to Judas as he's making his final decision to descend into despair. It's, it's an incredible scene. I love the whole character study of Judas that Mel Gibson did. I spend a lot of time on that in the book because I think it's <laughs> very instructive. Um, that scene, you know, is uh, at first you kind of think it's just a cheap shot. You know, you see this rotting donkey, donkey carcass. Then you see a close-up of its mouth. You see the teeth, you know, of the carcass. Yeah. And then you see maggots incubating and squirming and dropping out of. Sorry, we're getting a little graphic here. <laughs> you know, but, and that, and Judas turns around and sees it, right? And and that's when he he makes the final step to despair. You see him start to weep, right? Yeah. First of all, I asked Mel about that, and he said, well, it's an image of hell, where the worm dies not, mm -hmm. right? And where y y there's clench, there's, uh, what do they call gnashing of teeth. And one of the close-ups, you actually see the teeth of the donkey, and then you see a close-up of Judas's face, and the face in the center of the screen are his teeth, almost, you know, open, mm -hmm. his mouth is open, his teeth clenched in despair. But the fascinating thing about that scene and this is the kind of thing I think that really adds to your experience of the movie, the kind of thing that's in the book, is how Mel Gibson was able to get that performance out of Judas. You know, this utter pathetic descent into despair. Yeah. They did it over and take after take after take and wasn't getting it, wasn't right. Cut, 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 do it again, he's trying to get it. Finally, he told Judas, he said, okay, when you see that donkey, that rotting donkey carcass with the maggots, this is what you have to think to yourself. My soul is in worse shape than that. So that was the image, right? So they, they get ready, they say, okay, go, you know, and they run, we're rolling, and, and, and he, he looks and then he does the turn, Judas does the turn, sees the donkey, and he just started weeping, you know, shaking and weeping. It worked. And it was, Cut, we got it. You know, that was it. And that's how he got the performance out. It was, it's so fascinating to know kind of what went into those scenes. Thank you, Father. If uh, in conclu conclusion thought here, if uh, you're addressing any of our audience who may have been on a similar journey in terms of evangelical Protestant mm -hmm. involved mm -hmm. with the same kinds of groups that you were there in college with a deep commitment of Christ and evangelization, speaking to them, what, what would you say to them? <laughs> uh, would you like to say to them to encourage them to consider making the same journey home mm -hmm. that you did? Well, maybe three things real fast. I would say, first of all, don't be afraid of the Catholic Church. You have nothing to be afraid of. No matter what someone might have told you, or yeah. maybe what you even have experienced, you have nothing to be afraid of. We've been misinformed by those little tracks. Yeah, there's so so. nothing to be afraid of the Catholic Church. Um, and the second thing is, well, maybe there's just one more thing. Well, no, two more things. Yeah. <laughs> the second thing is, it, what I've found, and what other converts that I know have found, you didn't have to leave anything behind. 
you get all the stuff you have already, personal love for Christ, love for the scriptures, personal prayer, all the meaning that, that, you know, that God's revelation gives to our lives, to history, to our relationships. It's, you don't have to leave any of that behind, but you get so much more. There's so much more that God wants you to have. He wants you to have the sacraments. He wants you to be part of a bigger family. He wants you to have the example of the saints. He wants you to, to tap into this 2,000 year history of, of holiness and of evangelization in, in a deeper way. He just wants to give you more stuff. And finally, I would say, the, really the only question is, you know, and I know the answer, you, are, you want to get closer to Christ. Well, ask Christ, study the scriptures, and look to say, what did Christ have in mind for his church? What is Jesus' idea of his church? Did he leave it up to personal decisions and, and on, about the scriptures? Or did he establish a community? a new covenant community. Ask that question and ponder that question and trust and don't be afraid. Thank you very much, Father. Could we have your blessing? Absolutely. May Almighty God bless you. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Father, thank you for joining us thank in the you. journey home. Thank you for this book. Thank you for your, your not only desire to follow Christ in the church, but to offer your life a, as a priest. I mean, what a great, great, witness that is. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your great work. Keep Go it on. up. Thank you very much. I want to remind the audience again, that's Inside the Passion by Father John Bartunik, Ascension Press, forward by Mel Gibson. It is available on EWTN's religious catalog. That's 800-854-6316. And I do ask that the Lord would greatly guide you during this Holy Week. What a very powerful time for us. If you haven't completely surrendered to Christ, this is the time and ask him how he wants to guide you and your family to be deeper in Christ, deeper involved with his church through the graces of the sacraments. God bless you all. It's always a pleasure to be with you on the journey home, and I'll see you again next week.